Welcome back. This is segment five, cross-chain complications. Okay, so as we've seen so far, securing a protocol on a single chain is hard. And it goes to follow that securing a protocol that rests on multiple chains is even harder. And this is especially true when the two chains can't even natively communicate with each other. With that introduction, let me show you Atomic Loans. Atomic Loans is a decentralized loan platform that's built on both Bitcoin and Ethereum. The high level gist is that you lock Bitcoins, you get stablecoins. Easy. Uh, except due to the lack of native cross-chain communication, there is a really complex state machine that's implemented. And it's actually so complex that Atomic Loans provides an agent that you can run, which helps you navigate the Bitcoin-Ethereum interactions. So how exactly does it work? Well, in step one, Alice, the borrower, and Bob, the lender, agree to some set of terms. For example, how much collateral to lot, what the collateral ratio is, what stable coins to pay, stuff like that. Uh, these terms can be agreed on anywhere, but you'll probably be agreeing to them on the Ethereum blockchain where there is a smart contract to help facilitate this. After both parties have agreed, Alice and Bob initialize the loan using the same smart contract and commit some secrets. Alice commits A1, which allows Bob to withdraw, the, withdraw her collateral if the loan expires without being repaid, while Bob commits B1, which allows Alice to reclaim her collateral if she repays the loan. Alice and Bob also commit various A2, B2 secrets, which are used for liquidations, but are relatively unimportant in this example. Note that by commit, I mean that Alice and Bob will submit to the chain hashed versions of the secret, so they're not revealing the secret, they're just making it possible to prove that they're giving the correct secret after the fact. After the loan is initialized, Bob will lock their principal on Ethereum by sending it to the smart contract. Meanwhile, Alice will lock her collateral on Bitcoin by sending it to a P2SH address. For those who aren't familiar, P2SH stands for pay to script hash. And this basically is a type of address with, whose address itself is the hash of a script, a Bitcoin script. In this case, the script allows the funds in the address to be moved only if one of these is true. Either Alice signs the transaction and provides the B1 secret, or Bob signs the transaction and provides the A1 secret, and also the liquidation period is over. You can see that in this way, both Alice and Bob need the other party's secret in order to spend the collateral. After everything is locked properly, Bob confirms it and then unlocks the loan on ETH. Alice can withdraw the loan, but only if she reveals A1, and this is verified by comparing the hashed version of A1 to the previously committed hashed secret, uh, committed hashed version of A1. <clears throat> now Alice can use the loan however she likes, and when she's done, she will repay the loan, at which, Bob, at which point Bob can claim the repayment, but only if he reveals A1, therefore allowing Alice to reclaim her collateral. So in a system like this, it's usually good to start with some goals. What exactly is it do you want to do or exploit? Uh, in this case, there's a few different goals we can set. For example, as a third party, it'd be cool to steal either the collateral on ETH or Bitcoin, uh, either the locked loans on ETH or the locked collateral on Bitcoin. Alternatively, as a participant, it'd be cool if you could either steal the loans on ETH by not locking the Bitcoin or steal the collateral on Bitcoin without actually pro providing the loan. In this case study, we're only going to be looking at the third option, which is to take a loan without locking the Bitcoin. And to do that, there's really two options we have. The first one is to never actually lock any Bitcoin in the first place. And the second one is to lock, but somehow obtain the B1 secret so we can immediately unlock it. Let's take a brief aside to talk about how Bitcoin transactions work. Instead of Ethereum, where uh, account balances are just a number attached to the account, Bitcoin tracks balances using what's known as unspent transaction outputs. Uh, basically, the way Bitcoin transactions work is at a very high level, each transaction is a combination of previously unspent outputs and a set of uh, newly new outputs. So you take your old outputs, you combine them together to form enough uh, Bitcoin for your transaction, and you split them apart in a new way. Some of them might go back to you as a refund, the rest goes out as a new output to your recipient. In this way, each transaction will spend some inputs and generate some outputs. The way that Atomic Loans checks that your, you've submitted the correct amount of collateral is like this. First, it checks the balance of your collateral address, the P2SH address. 
This is given in refundable balance and seizable balance. It then checks the unspent transactions for both addresses. This is given in refundable unspent and seizable unspent. Finally, it checks three different requirements. The first requirement, the collateral requirement, if I can draw that line a bit straighter, this requirement basically says, is there enough balance in both addresses to fulfill the required amount? The second and third requirements are similar. They both say, does the first unspent output in each wallet contain enough, conf enough confirmations, in this case, a non-zero amount? Now, at first glance, for someone coming from Ethereum, this might look totally fine. Uh, you know, you, you have verified both that there's enough balance and the balance can't be reworked. However, it's important to keep in mind that we're not dealing with Ethereum, we're dealing with Bitcoin, and there's some quirks to Bitcoin that might not be immediately obvious. The first is that get balance, this RPC call, actually returns the balance of zero conf transactions. What this means is that the moment you send a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain, it's considered to be part of the balance, uh, even if it hasn't actually been mined in a block yet. Uh, the second quirk is that, or not necessarily quirk, but the RPC get, get unspent transactions uh, will return, obviously, a list of transactions. And so you can actually see that here where the code is checking for the first of the list of unspent transaction outputs. And so with these two quirks in mind, we can actually notice a very obvious attack here. The attack is simply to first, uh, to Bob's wallet, or sorry, not to Bob's wallet, to the collateral wallet, uh, transfer, say, 0 0.0001 Bitcoin, and then wait for it to receive one confirmation. Now, you see that we've immediately met these two criteria here because our first unspent output, uh, which is this output, has now gotten greater than one confirmation, greater than zero confirmations. The next step is to submit to the mempool another transaction. This one will have a value of 0 0.9999 BTC, and this will be zero conf because we just submitted it. Now we note that the moment this transaction is processed by the node that the agent is connected to, the balance will now be equal to one BTC. Furthermore, these requirements are still met for the confirmations, which means that the loan can be approved. But at this point, the second output still hasn't been confirmed yet. And so at the moment our loan is approved, what we can do is we can replace by fee this transaction with another transaction sending the, sending the Bitcoin to us, Alice. And for those who are, aren't aware, replace by fee is similar to how on Ethereum you can replace a transaction with another transaction that has a higher gas price uh, if it uses the same nuts. And so you can see in this way, we've basically found a vulnerability which allows us to take out a loan uh, without locking up essentially any collateral at all because we only need to lock up a very minimal amount. Okay, so that takes care of the how do we get a loan without locking up Bitcoin at all? Uh, question. What about getting a loan, locking in Bitcoin, and then unlocking it uh, before, uh, without repaying the loan? So to do that, we'll need to get the B1 secret from the agent. And the best way to start is simply look through the agent for where the B1 secret is published. And it turns out there's two cases. Either the loan payment is accept accepted or the loan itself is canceled. Now, we don't really care about the first because that implies we just repaid the loan, which means we now no longer have the loan, but the loan being canceled sounds interesting. The way that works is that if the loan has been approved but not withdrawn uh, for 22 hours, then the agent will automatically cancel the loan, right? And canceling the loan uh, involves publishing the B1 secret so that Alice can now withdraw her collateral. But if we take a look at how the withdrawal function works itself, we'll notice that while the loan can't be inactive and while it has to be funded and approved and not withdrawn, uh, there's no requirement here that the withdrawal expiration has been met. So again, if we look back, we'll see that 
the the loan is cancelable, or in other words, the loan can transition from the withdrawal state to the cancel state after 22 hours. But here, there's no enforcement that the loan cannot be withdrawn after being transferred into the cancel state. This means that what we can do is we can uh, we can act like a front runner again, wait until Bob is about to publish the transaction to cancel the loan, uh, observe the secret in the mempool, and then quickly withdraw our collateral on Bitcoin while at the same time withdrawing our loan on the Ethereum chain. So what this example goes to show is that with, mo with multiple chains, uh, we get multiple layers of complications. For example, each chain has its own nuances that for someone who's just, uh, who's just started developing on it aren't immediately obvious. So on Bitcoin, it might be very confusing for someone coming from Ethereum to find out, find out about zero confirmation transactions. Well, on Ethereum, uh, the concept of Bitcoin is very popular, but for, or sorry, while on Ethereum, the concept of front running is very popular, but on Bitcoin, that's not really a thing that happens. Additionally, building a cross-chain state machine is hard, uh, especially ensuring well-defined transitions between all the states, especially when you start getting into the dozens of states and the multiple of dozens of transitions. And with that, we end segment five, and I will see you in segment six, Escaping the Dark Forest.